General Baptist Church. Uh, we are located at 15914 Highway 107. Uh, we have a Wednesday night Bible study from 6 to 7 p.m. And on Sundays we have a uh, Sunday school from 10 to 11. And then uh, from 11 to 12 we have our normal worship service. Everybody's welcome to attend. The only thing we ask is you, you be ready to experience the love of Jesus and hear the word of God. Now I'd like to read a, a, a little illustration here. It said, in December 1994, syndicated columnist Bob Green told an inspiring, inspiring story of Rob, uh, Rob Moore. Rob played on the soccer team in his senior year at Wheaton Christian High School. In the final seconds of a big game against favored Wabanasi Valley, which his, which his team was behind by one goal, Rob was dribbling the ball in front of him, running at full speed toward the opponent's goal, and just before he shot the ball into the goal, he caught the side of the scoreboard. The clock read zero, but like any good athlete, Rob shot the ball anyways, and it went in for a goal. The referee signaled the, good, the goal was counted, it was good, and the game finished in a tie. Nobody won or lost. The Wheaton fans cheered. The, the Wabanosi Valley fans cried that time had run out. Rob had a choice to make. He could say something and avoid a loss. After all, it's the referee's job to call when the game's over, right? Not his. Or Rob could do what was right. Rob went and asked the referee whether the official time was kept on the scoreboard or the referee's stopwatch. The referee said the scoreboard time was official, and then the referee ran off the field. Rob went to his coaches and explained that just before his kick, he had seen zeros on the scoreboard clock. Since he hadn't heard a whistle, he kept playing, but his goal was late, and he didn't think it should count. His coaches agreed, and so they went over to the opposing coaches, explained what happened, and conceded victory to the opposing team. Bob Green ended the article with a quote from Rob Moore. Every time in your life you have an opportunity to do right, you should be thankful. For a person to know what right is and then not to do it, that would be a sin. To have won the game, I mean, really, who cares? Does the right thing, uh, doing the right thing is more important. It lets you have peace. But that wasn't the end of the story, writes Kevin Dale Miller. Sometime later, Bob, I'm sorry, Rob, received a handwritten letter from a total stranger, received to his personal address. It said, Dear Rob, I read Bob Green's wonderful column about you. I love sports and true sportsmanship. My faith in our future was renewed and lifted by that column, reading about your actions that day. Never lose your principles. Always stand for what's decent and right. That's what you told us all when you refused that victory. Thank you for being you. The letter was signed by former President George Bush. In life, we have to make many choices. They're usually what I refer to as we face forks in the road. We need to make a choice on which path we're going to take. We're constantly being faced with choices. A lot of times these choices stem from the battle going on for your soul. One side is Satan, and the other side is God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ. One side comes to steal and destroy. Another side comes to give you peace, happiness, and joy. One brings death and eternal, and the other one brings eternal life. Now, while the four Gospels present the words and works of Jesus Christ, 
There is a book in the Bible called the Book of Romans that explores the significance of Jesus Christ's death, what it means, and what it does for us, what it offers for us. The author of the book uses a question and answer format to plead his case. I love that. In life, we have many questions we are constantly faced with. And then we have a decision to make. If you will, turn to the book of Romans, um, chapter 6. Sorry, I should have already been there. This is when you can't find your book when you're under pressure. Luckily, I found it. Romans, chapter 6. One description of the book of Romans is, is for the following, that Paul records the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. Romans is more than a book of theology. It is also a book of practical exhortation. That is, it is a book urging people to do something. He is urging people to follow the will of God. Paul begins the, chap the sixth chapter with a question and an answer. And I've already missed my first slide here. So the title of today's message is, we're finishing out last week's sermon on um, Bulletproof Vest. And this is actually called Part 2, The Choice. The Choice. This is going on about the, the righteousness, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. But Paul begins the sixth chapter with a question and an answer. Right here, Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who, shall, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Shall we continue in sin? Of course not. We have been freed from that lifestyle, right? We've been freed through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed the day you accepted Jesus Christ that your life changed? Your outlook on life changed? Your desires changed? You know, me, before, before I found Jesus, I used to watch some really obnoxious stuff. And I thought it was so hilarious. None of that stuff bothered me. A lot of other list of things I used to enjoy. I can't stand them now because I've become a new person in Christ. I can't stand to hear, hear dirty language. I can't, I can't stand to, to see obnoxious behavior. That stuff just turns me off now. I don't think I'm any better than them, but I have no desire to hear that or witness that. I don't want to see what's on that guy's phone that everybody's over there gawking at. I don't want to hear them nasty jokes. It's because we've become a new person in Christ. We strive to live a righteous life. The old self, the unrighteous, should not appeal to us anymore. What should appeal to us is the righteous life. Now there was a king named King, king Asa. Man, I'm so glad I didn't mess up on that. Drop an A for an S. King Asa was a man that lived a righteous life. He was the third king of Judah and he was the fifth king of the house of David. He was the fifth king after David. And scripture tells us in 2 Chronicles and it said, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. How many of us can say that? Not many people can say that, but he did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. And then it goes on to say, For he removed the altars of the foreign gods in the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He got rid of all the idolatry worship, all the false worship. And then he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandments. 
also lived a righteous life. He took away all these idols, all these, all these um, um, things that were getting in people's way, all the stuff that was holding the people in, of Judea back. And he led the people back to God Almighty. He led them back to the Lord God Almighty, and he commanded them to follow God's law. I'm sure if he's the king of the kingdom, this is our law. This is what we stand on. This is what our kingdom stands on. He's making a foundational decision from the top. So what he did was he removed the obstacles, obstacles that were in the place of Judas, Judah's way. This is what Jesus does for us. He removes the opt- obstacles that are keeping us from entering the kingdom of God. That obstacle is our sin. He removes them chains that we carry around and that holds us back. Paul goes on to say, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we were also given a new life. We should no longer be slaves to sin. That Jesus died and took sin with him when he died on that cross. If we accept him as our Lord and Savior, he wipes away our sin debt. The bill is paid in full. Now, if you're in your Bible, go on down to verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. Verse 11 through 12. I got it on the projector too. Likewise, you also reckon, that is to be sure, yourselves to be in dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. You are saved and you are dead to sin. That is, you've been freed from it. It does not have that controlling force over you anymore. You are now alive in Jesus Christ. Paul says, don't let sin reign in our body. You've been freed from it. Let it go. Now, the temptation will always be there, but the difference is now you have a choice. You know, when a prisoner is freed from jail and a cell is open, you make a choice to walk out of that cell. Or you can say, nope, I'm staying back in here where I'm comfortable. Now, in the 14th century, in Belgium, there was two brothers fighting for control of the, the control of the, the, the land, the empire. I think they call it like the, the dukeship. The, the control to be the duke, the lord over the land. And usually that goes to the older brother, right? The way it all lines out. The oldest one inherits the land. The problem was the older one, his brother was named... Reynald, he lived a gross, grossly impulsive lifestyle. He was a gluten, uh, not a gluten, he was a, uh, a glutton and a drunk. And he couldn't give, let it go. And his younger brother was afraid that he would just destroy that kingdom. He would destroy the family's lordship. He would make a fool of it. And they started fighting for control of it. And then the younger brother, Edward, seized control by popularity. And so he had his brother, the older brother, imprisoned in a cell in the castle. He didn't kill him. He didn't put him in a prison. He had his own section in the castle to live in. There's no bars. There's no lock on the door. Reynold could leave any time he wanted to. The problem was, Reynold, Reynold, his nickname was Crossius, which is Latin for severely obese. His lifestyle caused him to be severely obese. So his brother put a door on his, where he's stationed at, where he lives at, and said he's free to leave whenever he wants. He can walk out the door. Some people say, hey, that's cruel. You got him in prison. I feed him whatever he wants. He has to make the choice. Does he want to change his life 
Or does he want to stay in this room that he's imprisoned himself in? Just like that brother had a choice if he wanted freedom, we also had to make a choice. The choice to put on that breastplate a righteousness. Paul goes on to give us some more advice here. Do you want to present the members of your body, that is, your eyes, your lips, your hands, your feet, all the parts of your body as instruments, that would be weapons, for good or for bad, for righteousness or unrighteousness, for the work of Satan or instruments of God's kingdom? Let's look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Sin does not have dominion over you, that is, it does not have control over you, because you have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. He knows we are not able to follow the law on our own. So through His grace, we are saved. The only thing we have a part of is making a choice to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We make a choice to receive that grace that Jesus hands to us. Being a Christian is not all fun and games. We look at Christians, oh, they got it made now. Oh, I'll become a Christian, I'll have it made. Wrong. It gets worse. You're tempted every day of your walk. You face many forks in the road daily, and you have to make a choice. The devil tries really hard. Matter of fact, he devotes most all of his energy to trying to separate you, a Christian, from having that relationship with Jesus. Or he works really hard for you to never gain that relationship. He wants us to abandon that loving and caring relationship with Jesus Christ. One of, our, one of Satan's schemes is for us to become self-reliant. He tricks us into thinking we don't need God's help. We might say, I'll, I'll, I'll figure this out. Of course, we all say, that's not me. I, I know we, Lord God is my Savior. He's my provider. He will do everything I need. He will take care of me. I know that God is my provider, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He has delivered me. We all rely on Jesus, the good shepherd, to take care of us. But let me ask you a question. Where's the first place people go for help? It used to be self-help books. Big section in the bookstore, self-help books. But there's something even more widespread than that and readily available to everybody. I almost guarantee everybody listening has done this at least once. Have we ever typed a problem we face? What do we do? Hey, let me get uh, Google here. <clears throat> Man, how do I get my kid to listen? How do I get to overcome this financial problem? How do I face this problem? How do I have that? We go to Google and look for an answer to life's problems. Luckily for me, my kid's no problem. She probably looks on her phone, how do I get my daddy to act better? But <laughs> we probably do it more than we realize it. Google is one of the most viewed websites on the Internet. What we don't realize is that our actions are telling God, hey, I, don't worry, I got this. I'm looking over here now, God. I know we got a Bible, but I'm, I'm going to look over here. This phone's right here. It's, it's, a whole, it's got tons of information, God. You should see everything that's available on this phone. I, I don't really know that I need your help anymore right now, God. Um, me and Google, we got this. We don't even realize what we're doing is, why, is what's so bad about the situation. 
We forget that God is bigger than any live situation we face. Not Google, but God Almighty. He should be the first person we seek for help. This bombardment of information that is available to us over a period of time can cause you to constantly think there is something wrong with you. What happens is we begin to dwell on the problem, what is wrong with us, instead of how there is a way to fix our problem. Big or small, that is called our faith in God Almighty. We have, to be, we have to remember that we have been saved by a loving, caring God who is the great I Am. He is the creator of the universe. We have been saved by His grace. Paul has one more question. He has another question for us. Let's look at verse 15. I got it right here on the screen. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? I love it. Certainly not exclamation point. Does being saved by God's grace, His unmerited favor towards us, give, a, give us a license to sin? Does it make it okay to sin because we're going to be we're saved anyways? He keeps forgiving us. It'll be alright. Right? It'll be okay. Certainly not, as Paul says. Again, we have to make a choice. To live righteously or unrighteously. To put on our breastplate of righteousness or to leave it in the corner of our room. Now I have, a, I have a 20 pound weight vest I wear when I work out sometimes. The group of people I work out with, they do a lot of stuff for like the military and police and all that stuff. And they'll wear the weight vest. It's mimicking wearing body armor, bulletproof vest. And it's 20 pounds. And this thing is hot, it's heavy, it's cumbersome, you can't breathe in it, and it's very restrictive. You can't move as well with this on. You know, to the, to the world's standards, a Christian walk can seem very cumbersome and restrictive. But think about this. If you're a soldier out in a battle, if you're on the front lines, you're being shot at, that body armor doesn't seem so restrictive anymore, does it? It doesn't seem so cumbersome because you realize it could save your life. It's protecting all your vital organs. It's the same thing with our Christian walk. When we choose to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the breastplate of righteousness does not seem so cumbersome or restrictive. Especially when you realize what, is this, what it is saving you from. The problem is, we pick stuff right back up. We'll try and dabble in it a little bit. Hey, you've been freed from that addiction to pornography. You've been freed from that addiction to alcohol. You've been freed from that addiction to gambling. But then Satan will tempt you. Boy, he, remember, he throws out that little desire. Man, maybe I just dabble in it just a little bit. Maybe if I go over here, my wife won't know. Hey, I'll go over here, nobody will know. The problem is, God Almighty knows. Paul tells us, whatever you choose to obey, that is what you become a slave to. That is what you call master. That is what controls you. That is why you need to make the choice to put on the breastplate of righteousness every day. That is to live by God's will for our life. Do what is in God's will for your life. We have two things to remember. Put God first before anything and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't remember nothing else, remember those two things and you're going to be okay. Don't pick up them chains of doubt, misery, hopelessness, fear, anxiety. Don't pick them up no more. Don't shackle yourself to those strongholds that were holding you back. Don't put that stuff before God. You will be attacked every day. Count on it. If you keep losing the battle, 
Ask yourself, are you putting on the armor of God every day? Are you making a conscious effort to seek God out every day? Are you, to, are you asking God for help in whatever you're facing? To put God before anything that you face in this world. To seek God for your inner strength to face this world. Or are you relying on Google? Hey, you know, me and Google, we got this. Are you for searching for answers on the internet? Or are you seeking God for an answer? We have to remember, we've been set free. We have been given a second chance in life. We have been given a new life through Jesus Christ. And we don't need to throw it away. We all have access to the creator of the universe. We have access to the one who has saved us from our sin, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All He wants for us is to live a fruitful life, full of peace and happiness and joy. He's there to lay out, lay out, hold our hand in whatever we face. So what is the benefit of making this correct choice in life? What is the sole benefit of doing this? What is the result of making the wrong decision? You have the correct decision and you have the wrong decision. What's the outcome of this? What's the results of this? You have to continually make choices in life. So what are the two outcomes you could face? Paul gives us an answer. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but to get to God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can either choose death or you can choose eternal life. You can choose a path of destruction or worse, a path of self-destruction a path of misery and despair, a path of hopelessness, or you can choose a path of freedom, of peace, of joy, and ultimately eternal life. The very first thing to this path is you have to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to have that one-on-one, -on -one intimate relationship with Jesus. You have to make sure that you have fully submitted to Him. Partially submitting doesn't do it. You have to fully surrender to Jesus. We can't fight Satan on our own. We can't fight Satan. We are not capable of it. That's why we need Jesus. That's why life gets better when you have Jesus in your heart. Him guiding you to make the right choice. Him giving you desire to put the breastplate of righteousness on. Ask everybody to stand, please.